Good evening, all. Tonight, I'm going to discuss several efficient and compact stealth antennas that I've used in my attic for over 34 years. I experimented with a bunch of them, and the ones I'm going to talk about work the best. And Bill, just one comment. If you click that hide down there, it'll it'll hide that little bar. Oh. There you go. Okay. I didn't know you could see that. Anyway, these antennas are also uh, useful for uh, small backyards. You know, there are many of us that only can dream about having a uh, antenna farm such as this. Anybody got one of those? I sure don't. Don't. Anyway, who am I? I'm Bill, W6OEV. I've been licensed and continually active since 1957. Over those decades, I've homebrewed many types of antennas, some of which were beautiful dummy loads. In 1986, I was transferred to a Denver HOA neighborhood. And during that time, I built and tested many stealth antennas. And uh, I learned a lot, that's for sure. Are my slides coming through OK? Yes, looks good. Good. OK, well, my goals when I uh, moved here was to have very efficient attic antennas, which consisted of a beam for 20 through 10, a dipole for 75 through 10, a mag loop, 30 through 10 meters, and a vertical for 75 through 10 meters. And all of these had to be tunable from the shack. My shack was in the basement. Two floors up was the attic antenna farm, and there was no way I was going to run back and forth there. As you know, you design an antenna to formulate your length, you put it up, then you got to spend a lot of time tuning. So I wanted to avoid all that. So basically, here's what we're going to talk about. There are many stealth antennas available, such as flagpoles, downspouts, fake weather stations, etc. However, I'm only going to cover the stealth antennas that I analyzed and successfully used over 34 years. And uh, these antennas are a regular and a modified 8JK beam, 20 through 10. Modified dipoles for 75 through 10. And this portion of the presentation is very important. I didn't realize what all you could do with the dipole. So you may want to pay attention to that part. And then I want to talk about one of my favorite antennas, mag loops, 30 through 10 meters, a uh, vertical, 75 through 10. And then we're going to show John's uh, video, the super coil. Very interesting. And he's got a few uh, little sidebars in there on the physics of shortened antennas. So I'm going to start off with the 8JK beam. And then later on, I'm going to cover how to modify it. So what is an 8JK beam? Basically, it's two center-fed dipoles spaced an eighth of wave apart. They're driven with a single feed line, which provides a 180 degree twist so that these two elements are 180 degrees out of phase. The 20 meter version, which I use very successfully, covers 20 through 10. On 20 meters, you get about 4.5 dBi a gain. And as you go up in the higher bands, because it works all bands between 20 and 10, you have 6.0 dBi. This is in free space, and that's compared to a dipole in free space, which has 2.1 dBi. So that gives you an idea of the gain. It can be made directional by playing around with the feed line. And I'm going to talk about that later. So here is my 8JK beam in the attic. It's bi-directional. As I mentioned, I was fortunate my house physically went north and south, so I was able to beam east and west. And you'll notice I have ladder line here, open wire. And I have it 
because anytime you remotely tune an antenna, you do not want to use coax because you can get a lot of loss depending upon the impedances. You can get flash over, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas ladder line, it can stand the uh, 20 to 1 SWR and the, the loss is very, very low. There's a couple articles in the round table if you're interested in that subject that go into all of this. And the reason that I went to a switch is because I had other antennas in the attic that also use open wire. So I could switch between this antenna, another antenna, fourth antenna, et cetera, using the common feed line down to the basement. So, Next, we're uh, going to go to uh, compact dipoles and beams. And in this case, we use no lossy coils. If you need to use a coil, John's going to tell you later in his video how to get, her, get around that issue of loss. In our case, in my case, I use bent elements. I was amazed to learn how you can bend a dipole in all kinds of different directions and virtually not lose any power or mess up your SWR, et cetera. It was a real eye-opener to me. All the years I flew with the antennas, I had never realized you could do all this. By the way, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to stop me. Why bend a dipole? Well, bending... up to 90 degrees, 50% from each end of the dipole, like over here, and not have any more than about six tenths of a dB of loss. There's a very good article in the May 1977 QST that analyzes this. I have the reference at the end of this presentation. And if you're interested, I got a lot of references, so you may want to be prepared to do a screenshot if you're interested. But anyway, you can bend these guys as shown here. I'm hoping these small pictures show up okay. Uh, Jeff, how do they look to you? Looks just fine. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure I wasn't talking to myself. But anyway, like I say, very little loss. Impedance will change very, very little. And here's... <laughs> Easy neck displays. <laughs> what was that? I say these are easy neck displays for those of you who wanted to know about easy neck. Oh, yeah. I got both displays. You're going to see them. Anyway, here's, here's what I mean and why this works. If we come in an eighth of a wavelength from each end, which is 50%, all of the current is in this area here, and that's what does the radiation. So if I go over here and I bend 50% in, 50% in, I still have most of the current doing the work. These portions do more like tuning the antenna, resonating the antenna, than they do radiating. And that's why this works. So when I read that article, I said, ah, that sounds too good to be true. I got to test this out. So some years ago, I built a two meter dipole and I built a bent dipole. And you'll notice I came in 50% from each end. I mounted both of these on 15 foot standoffs from the ground on tripods. I went up to a hill here in Denver, south uh, by Centennial. And at the time, W0THU Dick lived up on a hill in Parker. He was about 10 miles away, we had line of sight, and he had one of these super duper fancy expensive radios that measured GB rather than ash units. It was calibrated. And so I switched, not telling him what I was doing, I switched from this antenna to this antenna and back, and lo and behold, 
six tenths of a dB approximately is what he measured in the difference. So that kind of proved it. But reference to what John has said, I said, well, I'm going to do the theoretical analysis of this thing. I, it still sounds too good to be true that you can warp a dipole that bad and not lose much. So I ran easy neck and four neck two on a 20 meter dipole, 30 feet in the air, and then a bent dipole. 50% in from each end, 90 degrees. And here's what I saw. Just like that QST article said, the bent dipole was about six tenths of a dB less than a straight dipole. Came out to 7.53 dBi at one half wavelength high, which is about 33 feet or so, 32 feet above ground. So, the test I did with Dick, the easy neck, four neck two runs all indicated the same thing. So I said, okay, that means I can put a bent dipole in my attic. Before I show you it, I want to show you this. Again, you'll notice that a regular dipole, 30 feet high, and an SWR about 1.4, whatever. And then the bent dipole, it was 40. Not 47 minus J so and so, and the SWR was about 1.4. 2.5, 1.3. Bandwidth was pretty much the same. So as you can see, you can bend these dipoles all over the place. And uh, you don't change a whole lot as far as performance, which was a real eye-opening to me. With all the years I played with antennas, I just never bend. So anyway, I decided to take a look and say, okay, what happens Theoretically, if I bend the dipole, this is easy neck. If I had a regular dipole, it had about 5.3 dBi of gain. That was about half a wavelength high. As I started bending the ends, 10 feet, 10% from the end, 20%, 30% from the ends, you can see I could get clear down here to 50% from each end, and there's my six tenths of a dB. If I do 60 degrees, a percent rather, from the end, I still haven't lost that much. So that opened up a whole new vista as to uh, how you can bend these things to fit something. So looking down in my, at my house, this was the dipole that I had in the attic. It's all horizontal. And again, my open wire, window line to a remote switch and a tuner. Now, just to give you an idea of the pattern, because I'm not going to go through all the patterns on this thing, but on 75, which would be the worst band, you can see my attic dipole, which is 17 by 34 by 17. Basically, since it was you know, not very high off the ground. It was 30 feet off the ground. It's, the radiation is straight up. But the radiation straight up was 8.01 dBi. And on the regular dipole, which is 128 feet long, it was 8.57 in this direction. So I didn't lose much by bending this thing like this. And here in the middle, the yellow, it's about 4.2 on the bent dipole. And over here, it's about 5 or somewhere in that area. So you can see I didn't, uh, I didn't lose much in uh, bending this thing. So uh, I've been very, very happy with uh, my, my bent dipole. Now, when you go to the higher bands, 15 meters, 10 meters, yes, you start getting, you know, lobes but they're low angle. 
just like any antenna that's bigger than a half wave, you start getting lobes. But it was very efficient. So you can't fit a dipole in your space, turn it into a piece of uh, origami. Bend it any way you want. The dipole's parameters would change little. And of course, this opens all kinds of possibilities of getting a, particularly a 40 or 75 meter dipole in a small yard or an attic. Just sit there and, you know, bend it however you can get it in there. It doesn't make much difference at all because all of the radiation is done in this part right here. These just kind of resonate the antenna. Of course, here's the uh, well-known inverted V. So there you go. All kinds of possibilities. Now, you remember the HJK we looked at at the beginning. AF6SA first off bent his HJK as shown. I can't read it. I don't know if you can read it, but it's 5.9 feet this way, 11 feet on each side of the feet point, or 22 feet across. And then he wanted directivity because he lived, you know, on the west coast, I think it was. So he didn't really want to go beaming to the, to the west. So he moved the feed point of this HJK 4.3 inches in this direction. And that put the radiation here as shown. And the DBI on this thing was about 11.3 or something like that. Well, this is the outer ring. And Bill, I might mention to everyone, if you go into your settings and change layout to spotlight, it'll bring it up to larger screen. Layout to spotlight, okay. Just for the folks going. that are watching out there, if they go into settings. No, you don't need to do anything, you're fine. But if they go into settings and oh, change yeah. their layout to spotlight, yeah. Good, I'm glad you're making them do the work. Okay. Well, if bent dipoles are so efficient, are they actually used commercially? The answer is a resounding yes. Let's look at a couple of them. Here's a very popular European antenna by Inno, Inno Antennas, I guess you pronounce it. This is a three band dipole. There's a 20 element, bent element, the 15 element, and he didn't have to bend the 10. It's specced as 6.8 dBi at a half wave in elevation. A regular dipole is 7.2 dBi at that same elevation. So again, we have made this into a piece of origami and we didn't lose anything other than Big, you know, a lot of space. Now, the most common bent antenna is the Moxon. There's a lot of these out here, and I've used them on all bands, all the way up to UHF. Very common. So, here's a standard two element 20 meter beam, 33 feet, one inch, reflector, 34 feet, seven inches. So we take the uh, radiator and we bend it three and a half, three feet, five inches on each end. Take the reflector, which is a little bit better, bigger, and we bend it this way. And here's what we get. Good old easy neck. The Moxon is again about six tenths less than the two element Yagi. The Moxon has a little better front to back ratio and a little narrower here. So we're losing a little bit on the back, but we really don't care. It's a beam, we'll turn it. So <clears throat> the outer ring here is 6.23 dBi. And again, we're 20, we're half wavelength high on 20 meters. So we have proved you can take a, a dipole and bend it any way you want, or you can take a beam and bend the elements in, call it a moxon, and you're good to go. Okay. Here's a picture of a moxon. 
If you look hard, you can see there's insulators right here. So here's the radiator, the bent elements, and then the 20 meter radiator with the bent elements. So there's a lot of commercial people using bent radiators. And these guys are cute. This is a uh, commercial two meter. And you can see down at the bottom, down here, it's 38 and a half inches, which is what we would expect for a two meter beam. And it gives us 4.1 dBD relative to dipole. So we bend it up like one of these, and we only lose just a couple tenths of a dB, but we sure have shortened it. So instead of 38 inches, it's 27 inches. So you'll find these moxons even on uh, VHF. Now, here's one of my uh, favorite antennas. I, uh, I could talk for hours on this antenna. In fact, I have an hour and a half presentation I gave to the DRC before all this virus stuff happened. But uh, I'm always amazed at what it does. Okay, here's a commercial. Hey, Robin Hood doesn't convince me. What's that? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I had my mic unmuted, sorry. Good thing you didn't use any four letter words. I'd have been embarrassed. Anyway, I have a homebrew and a commercial mag loop in the, in the attic. This is the AEA. If you're not familiar with it, it has a secondary loop, which is usually about three to four feet in diameter across here. And that gets you uh, uh, 30 meters through 10 meters. And this is the uh, feed loop, coupling loop, which is about one fifth the diameter of this loop. Here's the schematic. This little loop here is this guy. And then this here, tune circuit is what does the radiating. And I have made so many amazing contacts with this thing. It's just unbelievable. And I've had people ask me, what am I using? I've never heard of a mag loop. But anyway, if you're interested, and if you're not familiar with it, you know, go to our round table. The very first entry at the top is the index of all the technical articles. Then you go down to whatever year and month you're interested in. But uh, they, uh, they work extremely well. Here's the beauty of it. I'm, like I say, I could go into all kinds of things, but just briefly, it has very little response to the E field, the electrical field, which is noise. It does have a heck of a lot better signal to noise ratio, 20 dB or better than a linear antenna. There were a lot of times when I would transmit on my HJK beam and I'd listen on the the uh, loop, and a lot of times the signals are pretty doggone close. It was weaker on the mag loop. It signal noise ratio was so much better. The loop diameter is, uh, oh yeah, I forgot what I was gonna say here. These antennas do not have to be high if they're set vertically, and I'm gonna get into that. Mine for the longest time sat on my deck, five feet off the ground. I worked all over the world with that thing. So it's good for a low angle DX, higher angle incoming signal stateside and NVIS. Extremely well indoors because the magnetic field in the vicinity of the antenna is not absorbed by your wiring and, and whatever. Uh, the magnetic fields tend to hit like a refrigerator 
go around it and keep on going. It's kind of amazing. This chart gives you a kind of idea of the performance of it. A three foot mag loop is plus 2.97 dBi. It drops down on 30 meters is minus 4.7 a dipole. These are all free space values. The dipole is 2.15 to give you an idea how they compare to a dipole. Ratio is really, really great. Let me show you why. Okay. Here is a mag loop that's five feet off the ground. That's all, five feet. And you notice we've got very low angle, high angle, all the way up to NVIS. If you raise these loops up, it doesn't change the pattern that much. So they don't have to be high on the loop right here. You can see the front to side ratio. That's why I had my mag loop on a, a rotator. And basically I used it to null out a strong signal if it was interfering. If you make it horizontal, you get omni radiation. Because now it takes on the characteristics of a dipole in the sense that if it's a Quarter wave high is good for your NVIS. If you raise it a half wavelength high, then you start to get the same pattern that you would get. Although a dipole would be somewhat directional off the ends, this is on me. So, uh, not in that way. Okay, I'm going to show you my antenna farm that I used for 30 years just to give you an idea. I might mention real quick, like, the reason I went into a HOA was I'd been on HF since 1957. I was kind of burnt out. Came along. That got me back on. So I had to figure out how to handle that. So what I did, this is my house towards the east. Here's that bent dipole kind of the attic. Here's the HJK beam that was down a little bit because I had four feet between the elements. One was my, uh, my uh, loop. And off to the side here was my vertical. And what I did is I cleared all the rock out of there. The uh, 35 foot by four foot hog wire ground plane covered the rocks back over it put an SGC auto tuner at the base of it, and away I went. Now looking down on the house, this being west, you can see how I had the HJK here a couple of feet down below the peak of the roof, and then here's that bent dipole I was showing you. Here's my rotatable loop. Here was my vertical. And not shown in here was the six homebrew J poles for VHF and QHF. I had quite an antenna farm in there. So, anyway. Hey, Bill, I'm curious as to how you routed your uh, feed lines down. Did you have a conduit or a plume? I was or? very, very fortunate. On the second floor, there was a hallway here. In the middle of the house was an air return to the furnace in the basement. So all I had to do is drill a couple of holes up into the attic, and I was right in the middle of all this stuff on that. Now that could be, you know, that could be an issue depending upon how you get the coax up there. I've known guys to go up the side of the house and then go over and then feed all this stuff. It was kind of interesting as a, as a sidebar. I used to meet every Sunday Air Force missileers that were stationed in Germany together off the net by saying, okay, OAV, give us signal reports in your attic. How's our signals in your attic today? So being in the middle of the U.S., I was kind of the beacon for these guys. And what'd you do for two meter and up? 
Uh, I had a whole group J poles for BHF and UHF, single band, dual band. Those all up in the so, attic also, or? All up in the attic, yep. I uh, I didn't have anything outdoors. Everything worked so well, you know, in the house there. We were a bit on a bit of a hill too, so that that helped me on VHF, new HF. To, uh, anyway, I worked all kinds of DX with this system, and unfortunately, I got to the point medically where I had to go to a single story house, and I had to have my son come over and take all this stuff out of the attic because I couldn't get up there anymore. So you got to keep that in mind. Anyway. I got a lot of references here, and uh, I'd say there'll be one towards the end if you want to do a screenshot. A good, good book put out by G0KYA to the RSGB, which is the European equivalent, English equivalent of the RL. A horizontal mag loop there in his attic. But a lot of good material in here. This is a pretty good book too, available at the ARL. Does anybody want to do a screenshot? Okay, guess we can. Okay, any questions? Larry, Larry Fagan raised his hand there. Did you want to say something, Larry? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, go ahead with your question. I'm not sure if he was asking a question or raised his hand because he wanted uh, a screenshot. Oh, there he a screenshot. I didn't snap it. Why don't you back it up, Bill? I think you wanted to get a screenshot of that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I tried to get a screenshot there. Uh, but we can. Your call is I've, uh, I, uh, very seldom I've ever bought a commercial antenna and got a lot of experience. So if anybody needs help building or tuning, or I've also helped a few people uh, figure out how to put stealth antennas in their attics and all that. So I'd be glad to help anybody that might be interested. Let me know when you got your shot. I have the shot. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Now, see if I can get over here. John, do you want to introduce your video and then I'll play it? Did we lose John? There we are. Sorry, had the mic muted that time. Oh, no problem. Do you want me to play it after you're done introducing it? Is this version got audio on it, or do you want to yes, be live? It, it, it does have audio. Go ahead and play it. It's pretty much self-contained. Okay, here we go. Blast off. Then I'll take questions right, after. What I'm going to talk about today is a... My latest project, got an article ready to go into QST on this one. I'm waiting for some, uh, a little bit on that one. Uh, okay, it's a jumbo loading coil made for concealed attic dipoles. You know, lots of people have a need for, for hidden dipoles. <laughs> A ham's attic has been a favorite hiding place for antennas for a long time. Amen and to we that. We have neighbors and we have homeowners association. And if our house looks much like this, uh, we're not going to have much opportunity to string 80 meter dipoles and so forth up. So, but we've got attics and a lot of people use them. By the way, is a is an antenna that's been getting quite a lot of um, action on readers thanks it's my slot cubes example of the six meter one here in front and the two meter one in back so i've written in saying that they oh they like these they put them up in their attic and nobody can see them <laughs> and i guess that's true Hi, baby. 
Oh, I didn't even hear me. <laughs> nope, it's the bird. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so uh, recently, uh, helping helping uh, build uh, both of these uh, by email. It's the email I've ever gotten. And here it is. I5AKH. And he sends me this. He built two of them. Your own two meter and six meter slot cube, 7963. Having your 16 year old grandson put them up in the attic, $2,600. His foot was deductible. That's what his son did. <laughs> I guess his son learned the, the sad lesson that when you walk around in attics, you stay on the rafters. You don't go down between <laughs> under the sheet rock. <laughs> when it comes to putting uh, HF dipoles in attics, as you can see here by the colors from red to green, maybe on, 80, on 10 meters or 20 meters, you might get, you easily can get a, an a HF dipole in your attic. To 40 meters, it starts to get pretty big, 64 feet. That's the total length of the mobile home. I'm certainly not going to get a, an uh, 80 meter one up there in the attic. I could bend the heck out of it and it might work, but I don't know. Well, we need to build an inexpensive, high efficiency, easy to make, and high inductance loading coil. Coil on your mobile, but, a, but one that will work for an attic dipole. Now, every ham especially those who have worked uh, mobile, certainly know about loading coils, and here's a couple of them. That one there on the left is uh, one that you might find in a, in a horizontal dipole. On the right uh, looks like an outbacker, I think, uh, uh, HF mobile. But these, these, and these loading coils are terribly inefficient. That if you've got a 40 meter mobile on your car, it's at best 5% efficient. Well, that's certainly true, and it's due to the loading coil. Under an attic, and here are a couple of attic that I downloaded off the, uh, e off the internet. Up there in the attic, big is beautiful. You want this antenna to be efficient. You want a big loading coil, big get enough inductance, but to be high efficiency. Anybody bought any copper tubing recently? <laughs> Here, here's, a, uh, here's a coil of 50 foot of, of half inch copper tubing, which is what you use if you want to make a high efficiency coil, 98 bucks at Lowe's. <laughs> well, here's my answer. It's a big cardboard tube. It's long and it's 12 inches in diameter. And on it is wrapped copper foil tape. This is much cheaper, much easier to get to. Hanging up in an attic. This is actually Greg WB2FXO's attic. I, I didn't have an attic in my mobile home, so I had to borrow his for the picture. Pretty much tie it, install it, and it can stretch the wires off the ends, as you can see there. And it's built on one of these. And this is the ad that Home Depot currently has for them. This is the very one I bought. A cardboard tube, about an eighth of an inch thick, uh, 12 inches by 48. I'm going to buy one of these. Uh, they come as, as a nested stack or a, a nest of almost full size. You got to look for one that really is 12 inches because there might be an 11 and a qu three quarters and so forth. They sell them as a stack because they don't care much about the concrete, just, but they might not be the right size. So take a tape measure along if you're going to buy one of these. There's the tape. I got it off the internet of uh, Amazon. As you can see uh, right up there on the top of the 
roll of tape right above the Fraley name. It's 45 feet long, an inch and a half, 1.5 mil or 15. 0.0015 inches thick. That's perfectly good. In fact, that's the equivalent of a tubing as far as an antenna goes. Uh, it's wider, of course, but it's uh, uh, but it's uh, it's it's thinner. But it's in terms of this antenna, it's the same thing as as building this coil out of half inch tubing. And it, sometimes at and uh, the in the uh, plant department, they sell it as snail tape. <laughs> you see that you can see that um, planter down there at the bottom with a strip of it around. I've got it around several of my planters here. Don't want to cross the copper. I guess they get their wet foot up there on that copper and it acts like a battery or something so that they won't cross copper tape. And by the way, that copper tape, only one fifth the cost of the copper tubing. So whatever you put into copper tubing half inch to build a loading coil for your attic, fifth the cost in that copper tape on the cardboard tube. Now, how do you get it on the tube? Well, that's kind of tough. Ever tried to put down shelf sticky stuff on a surface? It's not easy. So on the tube, you can see that line just, just near the top there, the black line. That was drawn on the tube, on the table, put a two by four against it and drew a line. Then I put marks every two inches. That's the spacing we need for this coil. I'll file some, some cardboard, light cardboard, just that uh, uh, card weight uh, paper stock. Or you can use the covers off of plastic, cheap plastic notebooks that you might buy from 99 cent store. Inch wide strips, tape them together until I had one that was 48 inches long. You wrap that strip around the tube lining it up with the marks as you can see there at the top and the edges together and it makes the form of a helix and think you take your sharpie pen and you draw along the edge now you do this strip by strip until you get the 23 turns marked on the tube now you've got a guideline for putting on that tape that's pretty easy to put on once you've got that guideline lots of uses for this coil uh, this is just one. I'm going to show you one example here. And this is a 40 meter loaded antenna, attic antenna dipole, center loaded, uh, double it, one third the size of a standard 64 foot dipole, which would probably go in most attics. So it's a good example of what you can use this coil for. but. You can use it tennis like this, so I couldn't possibly uh, show all possibilities, but here's one example anyway. Here's a drawing of it showing you the, uh, the antenna, the coil, the 23 turn 12 inch by 48 inch copper tape coil sections coming off the end. They need to be heavyweight too, and I did use copper tubing for those half inch copper tubing coming off the end. I suppose I could have used the tape, but that would have been not so efficient. Probably don't have to be that husky on those ends, but uh, that's what, what I recommend. Uh, uh, OEK had made that nice drawing at the bottom. You notice the little coupling loop? This is a good, this is a good way when you have an antenna that's low impedance, and any small antenna is low impedance, active coupling loop, you see these frequently on uh, compact transmitting loops, or what some people call magnetic loops. Secondary little coil that couples to the main loop. A good easy way to match these, uh, any low, end, low impedance antenna. And you can see Jim shows it there in orange at the bottom with the one-to-one -one ballon, and they definitely want to use it with a ballon. The ballon. The coil, as you can see here, goes inside of the tube. 
anywhere you want along the coil because the field's pretty uniform. The magnetic field down the down the tube inside the coil is pretty uniform, so the, the coupling coil can go almost anywhere. Suspended inside the cardboard tube by a couple of uh, aluminum spacers, which I just cut out of some aluminum tubing, inch and a half spacers, and then some some bolts which uh, come in through the side uh, to allow that coil to be rotatable. And you can see the feed point also down there at the bottom, just a fanned out coax connecting to a, some ring terminals and a couple of 632 screws, eight inch gap there. So it's a one turn loop, coupling loop, one, it's an inductive coupling loop, rotatable. Why is it rotatable? So this is what you use to adjust the SWR. Works, works really slick. In that position that you see there, the SWR is, a, is right near one to one. Ask the question, why do we need such a big coil? Now, this is a sort of a generic section to this presentation, but it's an important one. I, I think that a lot of hams don't really understand. They do, but uh, anyway, it's uh, worth going through this. Why do we need such a big coil? It's the equivalent circuit of an antenna. You can sit down there at the bottom. It's made up of four things. All antennas have this same equivalent circuit. That's, that's natural to any piece of wire, straight, straight wire. So a straight antenna wire has natural distributed inductance. It also has natural distributed capacity. That make it resonant, you know. So much L, so much C, it's resonant on a given frequency. That's natural to a, any length of wire, as we know. L and the C that's natural in natural of any antenna. But there also in every antenna are two resistances. You can see them on the right. Conductor resistances. That's just that's just the copper resistance which you can measure with an ohmmeter. You could actually put an ohmmeter on the wire and measure it. Low, but uh, all antennas have that conductor resistance in them. Also, all antennas have another resistance. As you can see, it's in series with the coil and the capacitor. Do the work, but, but the resistances. Uh, <laughs> this one on the right is called radiation resistance. This is the mystery. A lot of hams don't really understand that term at all. It's a simple, it's really a simple thing. And it's present in all antennas. What is it? Thing of space on the antenna. Space creates a load on the antenna and it looks to the antenna just like a resistance. But notice the two of them are in series, those two resistances, the, the conductor resistance and the radiation resistance. The radiation resistance is the good guy and the conductor resistance is the bad guy in antennas. And think about an antenna kind of like this. There's a bowl of jello. You can think about an antenna and space with this. This is a metaphor, an analogy, but it, it's a good one. The space around an antenna puts a load on an antenna here, symbolized by this green line. Like a bowl of jelly, you might say space is a is a is a bowl full of jelly. Sounds like Forrest Gump. <laughs> so it's like you can imagine your any antennas in a in a in a infinite bowl of jelly. Actually, uh, technically, it's more of an infinite electric magnetic field, static field. Uh, it's the it's the, the the natural magnetic ele electric magnetic properties of space. It's just what it's like, and it it loads down any antenna and creates in the antenna, antenna a thing called radiation resistance. Now it's a real resistance, just like the conductor resistance is. For example, it's much like you drop a drop a pebble in a pond. The water is like the radiation resistance. It, it, it resists the pebble when you drop it in. And the resistance 
of the water to that pebble creates the ripples leading out just like the waves off of an antenna. So it's a, I, I like this I like this analogy and this metaphor. It's all you all you do is when the currents run back and forth in the antenna, they shake the jello. <laughs> The, the reactance or the, the, the inductance and the capacitance there on the left, which is what, which is the property of the antenna itself. This is in series, so the current has to run through all four of these. But the current, when it runs through the ohmic resistance or the conductor resistance, doesn't do us any good. In fact, it wastes part of the power from the transmitter. No good. We don't, we don't like to not have that. Ideally, the perfect antenna would have no conductor resistance at all. That would be, it would radiate all the power into space. But it only radiates part of the power into space as, as is, is it, does it in the radiation resistance, the loading of space around the antenna. The transmitter has to share the conductor resistance loss with the radiation resistance, which is where the waves are generated. Now, this is important, what's below. Radio, conductor resistance, R sub C, that goes down in size, goes down in proportion. So an antenna that's one third as long has one third as much conductor resistance, straightforward. But resistance, the good resistance, goes down as the square of the side reductions. So that's the mean point. That's why small antennas need big conductors because this 40 meter example has three times the loss size 40 meter dipole because of that relationship. The radiation resistance, but, all, but one third the conductor resistance. So it has three times as much now uh, conductor resistance as it as it you should like it to have. Here's another loss factor in in loading coils. There's a round conductor there, the purple conductor. I was look, looking at the side view of a conductor. I think most hams know that there's this thing called skin effect, and it gets worse the higher you go up. Maining field in the wire causes the electric currents to move outward towards the edge of the wire. It doesn't go all the way to the edge. It, it, it's sort of in, in the amount, the inside of the conductor, as symbolized here by the purple. What does this do, though? Well, it means that the conductive conductor resistance of that wire is decreased because most of the current is flowing on the edge and very little of it flowing in the middle. So we have greater conductor resistance, which is what we don't want. It's a loss in loading coils. It's the major loss in loading coils. Particular, particularly if in a loading coil, you put the turns right next to each other. And what's called adjacent turn skin effect loss. The current now not only runs to the outside, it only runs up on the top or the bottom. The adjacent turns push it, the field up in there, push it even more. So the current's only running on the top or the bottom of the windings of a loading coil close together. How do you fix it? You space the turns, a three to one spacing. So a half inch, a half inch diameter wire should be spaced three quarters of an inch apart of the, to get rid of the, uh, conductor, the adjacent turn uh, skin effect loss. And that's exactly what we have here in this loading coil. In fact, we have better than a three to one spacing. By spacing that half inch tape, which is equal to half inch round, two up here together, we have better than a three to one spacing. Okay, how does this 40 meter attic dipole compare to a full size dipole? up in the attic? Good question. Okay, these, I can't actually give you some real field measurements, but in a, in a testing range, 
anechoic chamber, anechoic chamber. But here's what Easy Neck does for it. You can model, you can model both of these antennas quite easily, even the loading coil, and yes, even the flat wire. Easy Neck. He says, oh yeah, just just use. Just use a round tubing that's the same size as that's half the diameter of the flat tubing, and it'll work the same. The model of a 40 meter dipole made with half inch copper tubing, and I made a, a similar one with this this one that I'm showing you here with the loading coil, and it's only one third the size. And you can see the blue line is the 40 meter conventional dipole with its standard 2.1 dB. EBI gain and the 40 meter dipole. It's only down a little bit, the loaded one, down by how much? Uh, 0.7 dB. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to notice that. So this thing works pretty much. And of course, both of these antennas up in your attic, and I, I modeled them at uh, 15 feet off the ground, probably a typical attic height. Of course, they're cloud burners. 40 meter dipole at 15 feet off the ground is a cloud burner. It's not going to, it's a high angle radiator. It's not high enough. I have a rule of thumb for antenna or horizontal antennas. If it's not half a wavelength off the ground, it's a cloud burn. Whoops, my battery. Let me plug the power there. We go. All right, let's tune and match this antenna or any attic dipole. Here's the big bugaboo bug with shortened antennas. As they get shorter, they get narrower. Anybody who's ever run Mobile knows this, where you've got, to, you've got to get out and pull out the little stinger on the end if you want to move up and down the band. This loading coil. Here's this, four to, here's this three to one shrunken 40 meter dipole. And again, in red, and the same, the same 40 meter dipole full size in blue. Same materials and so forth. This is the same easy neck modeling. And you can see that that attic dipole is only 18 kilohertz wide at the 3 dB points. Whereas the full size dipoles 1.28 megahertz wide. What do you do about it? Well, you don't. You got to just make up for it somehow. All short antennas have this problem and all short antennas have to be dealt with. Here's how I do it. Here's a piece of, uh, of the coax shield stripped out of a piece of RG8. As you can see, I crimped on some ring terminals on the end. The bolt there at the right is the end of the coil. Through there to hook up to the coil. Put some washer on it to make good connection to the copper winding. On the left, is a movable tap. It is a magnet, a neodymium magnet. Now, which, which one of you is going to ask the obvious question? What's the obvious question? It doesn't stick to the copper very well. <laughs> Magnetic. How in the heck do I make the, the magnet stick to the copper tape? Voila. <laughs> there you are. You just take a little stack of the magnets, you put them on the inside, field runs right through the right through the cardboard, right through the copper tape, and the magnet sticks like glue to the top. To make a move. I used this in the past when I was putting aluminum foil uh, 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 slot antennas on glass. I wanted to make connection to the aluminum foil. Same thing, can't solder to aluminum foil. These magnets are pretty inexpensive. You can get them from Amazon. Here's the here's the listing from Amazon. You can get a twenty of them for uh, for uh, fourteen dollars. Ones that have the holes in them, so you can use a screw. I I always I keep a bunch of these. Use them for all sorts of reasons. But uh, they're readily available on Amazon in all sorts of sizes. I use the three quarters. I could have used one inch uh, just as well, but the three quarters work fine. Okay, there are other, other options to fine tune this antenna or to even grossly tune the antenna. If you want to go the deluxe way, put a remote auto tuner up in your attic. You know, they're expensive, 
400 buck auto tuner, but they certainly would give you a nice automatic tuning one. And this way you can tune it up on other bands. If you're enterprising and want to go to the trouble of doing all the design here, you can build yourself a little relay box and, and switch in some, some L and C networks, some, some L matches up there. That's if somebody wants to do a lot of design work, that's fine. I've thought, I've never actually built one of these, but uh, just to use some stepper motors and hook them straight up to a standard tuner and uh, drive, this, drive, the, drive the tuner remotely with stepper motors. All of these would make some way to tune up an attic antenna like that. Got a BNA and hook it up. Tune it up until the, you get the SWR low at whatever it tunes up to. Then you adjust the frequency. I discovered over the years, I discovered this in Easy Neck. you could make this thing go all the way down to 160 meters. How do you make more turns on this coil? Well, either you use more coils, you put two of them in series, or you make the windings half as wide. At least half an inch will work fine. It's still it's the equivalent of quarter inch copper tubing. So it'll still work. So if you want to go down in frequency to 80 meters, use half inch tape and half inch spacing. So if you do that, have to use more coupling turns on that coupling loop. These are just some of the variables that you'll run into. I can't possibly cover all the bands, all the frequencies. Adapt this coil to any frequency you want. If you only want 20 meters, then, then, then use much less, uh, much less coil. Prefer, though, to use more wire and less coil. You'll get better bandwidth out of it. Here's the, here's in fact uh, my way of, of using less turns. I just change bands with taps or whatever. You just short out some turns. A graph I prepared shows you what frequency you'll get out of this this coil with the same ends on it, these same ten and a half foot ends on it. If you just start shorting out shorting out turns. About one turn, it'll it'll rise from a little under seven meg to a little right at seven meg, and so far up there, go up to five megahertz. You'll need to short out about five turns to make this thing work on on uh, 
60 meters. Uh, if you want to make it work on uh, 20 meters, well, we just don't quite make it. <laughs> don't quite make it with these 10 and a half foot ends. So what do you do? Just chop a little off the end, but use turns. <laughs> Use less turns and more wire, not more, not, not more turns and less wire. Why? The bandwidth will get black, get narrower. You can make it work that way, but you don't like the bandwidth. If you've got a home like this, but you've got an attic, try out a loaded attic dipole. They're, they're pretty effective. 